It is time to go down memory lane here at Aintree, ahead of the Randox Grand National. Phil Turner's alongside me, head of handicapping at Timeform. And Phil, let's go down memory lane. It's 2021. Let's look back at nationals with one in the number and start in 1961. What was this place like compared to now? back then? Uh, probably barely recognisable. It was, uh, it was in a bit of a sorry state, um, not totally through the fault of the, of, of the then owners, the Topham family. Um, I mean, the Grand National, probably its heyday was, you could argue, was between the wars. The, the, the race was in a really sort of rich place. You're regularly getting a quarter of a million people here for the Grand National in, in that period. Um, it's not a coincidence that Hollywood made a film about it. National Velvet came on the back of that period because you're regularly getting American runners there and all the best horses were running in it. So it was in a really rich place then. After the war, like many things in post-war Britain, it was a bit of a struggle. And in the 50s, the, both the race and the course was in a bit of a sorry state. Um, there were questions in Parliament whether the race should be continued, because unfortunately there'd been some, there'd been some deaths in, in, in that period. The, the fences were really, really unforgiving. When we got to 1961, that was actually the first time they'd, they'd modified all the non-ditches, the takeoff side were made, and that was deemed to sort of big, a big improvement on that stake. So they'd sorted the course part of it out. The actual sort of venue, um, it was falling to pieces a little bit. The stands were in need of big repair. They tried to sort of bolster the funds by building a Grand Prix circuit here, which the, the track still runs around the track. And they the, go the other way around? So it go, yeah, which goes the other way around to the Grand National. They shot past clockwise, here. Yeah, and the finish, the, the sort of Sterling Moss beat Fangio here in a tight finish Brilliant. in 56, I think it was. And it used to alternate with Silverstone. The British Grand Prix was running here for about six, seven years. And the only, that was really to raise funds and it was packed again. And the only reason they lost it was because of the uncertainty of Aintree's future. And in the end, it was put up for sale in the mid 60s. Um, and it was not the huge outcry you might have thought to save the race because it was post-war Liverpool, there was a desperate need for housing and lots of MPs were saying, we, we need houses, not horses sort of thing. So it was like, a, it really was in threat. And it, that uncertainty hung over the race for about 20 years until Jockey Club bought it in the early 80s. And it's been said many times before, but Red Rum's part in saving the race cannot be understated. It really, but really it, did save it. But in 1971, we hadn't quite got to that no. stage yet so still presumably then this place was struggling it was yeah it was it was a it was a it was literally sort of pretty much every year will this be the last national um that went on for, for, for quite now, a while when you look at the facilities yeah, and the it course is i mean it's sort of it of really rain. you know it I, when i first came here in 1980 you you would not recognize the place compared to now it's it's great the way it's sort of uh it's been spruced up just you know every every facet of it is just completely different to what it was before so it, it's good and 61 you know as we're getting back to the race itself it, part of the initiatives they were sort of doing to sort of raise the profile of it we had the, the novelty of two russian runners in the 1961 uh, grand national they'd invited um at the height sort of the cold war they invited uh, three horses made the 2000 mile trip by train and boat um, one of them unfortunately took ill when he got here. They were they were stabled over at Haydock, and really it was it was too much of a rush job. They, whenever the American horses, probably that might have been the reason that they they were keen to have a go because American horses had done well in this race. Battleship won the race in the mid 30s, and another champion American horse nearly won it in in 1928. So you know, Russian, we want to show our dominance and <laughs> bring over horses well, but they did it sort of in a two week period because of the, the the rules then any international runner had to carry automatic top weight so that stymied them from the start um peter bromley actually the, the bbc radio commentator he went over there as on a sort of a fact-finding mission and took over a video of the 1960 national which was the first televised national and the russians watching it said have you sped the tape up <laughs> yeah, right. really? they didn't realize what they were really in for and the two horses who, who ended up running unfortunately one got to he was towards the rear of the field he unseated at first beaches the chap remounted him, but he was miles behind. He eventually pulled up at the, at the water jump, and the other one got the first canal turn and, and unseated. And uh, I don't think the Communist Party were all yeah. pleased that the, sort of that was the, the outcome of it, and they, they were never to return, which was a, which was a shame. But it was certainly it brought a lot of attention. It was such a novelty, and that that kind of thing regularly happened. You'd, you'd have sort of like celebrity riders, and I think the Grand National in those days it was. Often people viewed it a bit akin to sort of, I don't know, climbing Everest or swimming the channel. People wanted to challenge yeah. themselves and have a go and just getting round and uh, that sort of bought into it. So who won in, in 61? Oh, 61, it was, it was a race where there was, um, 
I think there were six Grand National winners took part in it. It was probably, probably some sort of record. Not all of them had won the race at that stage. And victory went to a grey, Nicholas Silver, um, who was the first grey, I think, for 70-odd years to have won it. And I think Neptune Colange is the only one since who's done. So he was a popular winner in that regard. He was towards the bottom of the weights. That probably helped him. And he was trained by Fred Reimer, who, of course, went on to win four Grand Nationals. So he was, he was a good winner, but he was weighted to win, if that makes sense, uh, as opposed to being a, a, you know, a, a notable one in some sort of you know, high performance. On to 1971, an important winner with regards to the future of the race. Well, it was in the sense that it was, um, it was owned by uh, F Fred Pontin, who was a popular chap who used to run sort of holiday camps in, in, in this country. And I believe um, that's who Trevor Hemmings worked for. And I think that's his, his love of the race came from Specify's uh, antics in winning. What, look, the horses who were involved in the finish in 71, they weren't particularly great names. They won't go down in the history of the sport, but it was definitely one of the most exciting finishes in Grand National history. And in an era where the, the future of the race was in doubt, it played very well with the public. The once-year punters thought that's exciting, even though the, most of the principals were, were big prices. And most of the fancied runners were out of the race early, actually. I mean, Gay Trip was the previous year's winner. He fell at the first, which um, just shows how tricky a fence that can be. You know, even the safest jumpers can go at it. Uh, the Laird, who'd been runner-up in the Gold Cup, he was one of the other fancy runners. He fell at the third. And there was a well-backed horse called Lord Jim. He was out of the race before... I think at the 11th so a lot of the fancy ones are gone and it was it really was a race if Betfair had been around in 1971 they would have been in running carnage <laughs> because there was a horse going well strongly in front at second beaches and the jockey fell off sort of after the fence the, the drop caught him out an early leader was taken out of the canal turn nearly ended up in the canal but a loose horse took him out there and uh, John Buckingham had won the race on Foyne Avon. Uh, he was on another 100 to 1 shot line burner. He was disputing second, still in with a chance from falling at the second last. This is sort of all going on. There was another horse who ended up finishing third called Asprey, and I think the jockey dropped the whip on him somewhere on the final circuit. So hard luck stories abounding. And the one who was in front jumping the last was a mare called Sandy Sprite, who probably should have won the race. Uh, she went lame, broke down on the running. She was still leading at the elbow, and she ended up fourth. Four horses passed the close home and she ended up finishing fifth. And although horses of mares have finished sort of closer in terms of finishing position, she's probably the closest mares come to winning it since 51. I didn't know that. Um, so she was very unlucky. And the winning horse specified was given a great ride by Johnny Cook. He just kidded him into it. He just kept sort of sneaking him through gaps and he sort of pushed him to win virtually late on the line. He, he sort of, without having to go really heavy on the whip with him, and he sort of just got on, beat Black Secret into second. It was an Irish horse who was ridden by uh, Jim Draper, who was a young amateur then, who very shortly afterwards took over his, his ailing father's training operation. So this year, 40 years on, our big feature on Saturday on ITV is Alden Eaty yeah. and Bob Champion. And when I interviewed Bob the other day, he said, people forget I rode other horses. But am I right in saying, didn't he have a ride? He did. It in was, 71. It was, um, he had a, it was an outsider. I think it was called Country Wedding, 50 to 1 shot. Uh, that was his first ride in the Grand National. And he'd done everything right. He, I don't think he'd eaten breakfast for a week because it was on 10 stone and Bob always struggled with his weight. And he got down to the, the weight and, you know, really um, starved himself. And then he thought, right, I'm not going to be gung-ho or daredevil. I'm going to sort of, in those days, the drop used to be much bigger on the inside. So I thought, right, I'll go towards the outside. And then he thought, who's the safest horse to follow down to the first? Last year's winner, Gay Trip. <laughs> and he tracked and Gay Trip all down here. the first. And poor old country wedding jumped the fence fine. And Gay Trip was on the floor in front of her. And uh, it brought down at the first. So all those dreams up and gone in after but, 20 seconds. But 10 years later, ten I think years this is not just the best racing story ever. This is one of the great sporting stories. It was, it? yeah. No, I mean, it, it was. It's sort of, I think we, were, we all sort of know people who've been touched by cancer. And it was, it was a heartwarming story to come back, you know, 40 years ago, being told that news must have been shattering for him and uh, to have come back as he did after the treatment he had was remarkable. And it was, it was also the, the, the story with the horse as well because, um, I mean, he was stable jockey to Josh Gifford. It, he wasn't the only horse Josh Gifford had, a good horse he had. There was a horse called Kaibo and I was a really top-class hurdler, Bob Champion like riding, other horses like approaching, modesty forbids. But I don't think it's poetic license when they say Old and Easy was his favourite. And when he was early in the sort of fight with cancer and he was not doing well, one of the few times he went to the race course was to see Aldenisi run, and that was when Aldenisi broke down. And he said it really set him, he, Bob Champion admitted it set him back for a couple of weeks. He really thought, you know, it just wasn't what he needed yeah. at, at that time. And the fact that the two of them came back together at the same time, 
older than it, he, he won his comeback run at um, Ascot, put up a great performance and went into the Grand National as second favourite and obviously the, the story gathered legs yeah. once we realised what had happened to yeah. you know, both, both, both of them. And, um, and it was a good class renewal. I mean, it, should, it shouldn't be forgotten. I was on the, the second. And I thought, the time, I thought at the time the 54-year-old jockey had had a yeah. shocker, but without realising, one, the story of Alden Eaty, and two, yeah. that you, John Thorne was producing miracles. He probably did have a little bit of a shocker. I think it's sort of like if social media had been around nowadays, he might have said, you gave that a bit to do there, John, <laughs> yeah, because he but did come from 54, a long way back. I think, but it was, But at the same time, it was a known quantity. It was his horse. He'd always yeah. ridden him. And Spartan Missile, he was an outstanding hunter chaser. He was not a normal hunter chaser at all. Um, and... People have been waiting for this horse to run in the Grand National. He, he, in fact, he was due to run in 1980. They pulled him out because the ground was so bad that day. He was among the favourites mm. for the 1980 race. It's not like it, it had come from nowhere. He nearly won a whip bread uh, in 78. And they ran him in races like the Grand Steeplechase to Parry, you know, as well as following the, the conventional hunter chase route. So he'd lined up for the Cheltenham, finishing fourth in a really good Cheltenham Gold Cup renewal. So that's why he went off favourite. He'd always been a good horse and it was a known quantity that this guy always writes him yeah, so it's yeah. sort of in fact I think when he won the 78 Fox Hunters here I think he lost his I know he he had an ungainly style but I think he lost his irons completely from second beaches so it was a it was a remarkable performance to hang yeah. on and win that day uh, and the two other horses involved in the finish Alden Eaty and Royal Mail they were class horses as well they were second and third in the 79 National so if you think to this year's renewal that that would be Annabelle Fly and Bristol yeah, Dumai yeah. you know they're placed yeah. horses in the Gold Cup coming to the National so for all the stories in, in around it, they were good horses as well, and it was a, it was a good quality of renewal. And I mean, fair play to John Thorne; he was the first person who congratulated Bob Champion yeah. crossing the line, and you know that did show the, the sporting nature of it. You'll see it all again on Saturday. And Bruff Scott narrating it because Bruff Scott went to see Bob Champion, which says it all in hospital, and basically said he thought he was saying goodbye that day. Yeah. So to come back and win a national, I think it was, and it, and it should just you know big up to the other connections because when he came back. It was a struggle to begin with, and a lot of the owners were saying, well, we want another, you know, how racing goes, we want another jockey on it. And, you know, Josh Gifford and Aldenity's owners, the Embiricus family, they, they, they stayed steadfastly loyal to him, and, uh, you know, they reaped the rewards. So my first national was 1990, and you, there used to be a party out of the canal turn. But in 91, I actually had enough money to come into the stands, and I stood... Phil, to your right there. Oh, I, I, I well, we, we, we were, we would have in an absolute throng. I was there as well. We didn't know it at the really? time, so we weren't. Far and then, because I was on Seagram and jumping the last, I thought, oh, he's run a big race, but it's all over. Yeah, well, I, I, I you know, without sort of blowing our own trumpet, I backed Seagram as well. But I'm like you. At the same time, I was thinking we're seeing history here yeah. because it did think we were going to see Garrison Savannah had won that year's Gold Cup and. There's only been two horses who've won both races, and there's only one horse who's won it both in the same year, and that was the great Golden Miller in 1934. He's the only horse who's won the Gold Cup and the National in the same year. And Garrison Savannah, for 95% of the race, looked like he was going to do, this, do exactly the same. And everything had, had gone like a dream for him. He jumped superbly, he was in a perfect position throughout. And I don't think anyone watching at the time thought, oh, Mark Pippen's kicked for home too soon there. He, he'd basically done everything right, and for some reason, it stopped on the running, and they would have been in running carnage because, as I say, he would have been odds on. Seagram would have drifted, and, and like, not only did Seagram catch him, I mean, Nigel Hawke celebrated for the last 100 yards. <laughs> he also yards, came right this near side, Yeah, didn't he? exactly. He came, came to see us on the stepping. Yeah, it was, it was just incredible to watch. I don't really know, even to this day, what, why he emptied like yeah. he did, but it, was, it all tied into the fact that, of course, Mark Pittman was the son of Richard Pittman. He had pretty much the same happen on Crisp and Red Rum in probably the most famous Grand National of all time. And apparently, I think Richard Pittman was obviously working for BBC in those days. Can you hear the song here? This is uh, not for Everton fans. This, this is what an Evertonian <laughs> wants to hear when he's talking about the Grand National. Yeah, right. Uh, uh, he was commentating for the BBC, obviously, in the, in the summarising role. And he'd actually got up uh, to go and celebrate with oh. Mark. And Bill Smith, who was in the, yeah. who was in the commentary booth with him, just told him before he went to the door, uh, said, hang on, it's changing. Yeah. Yeah, right? um, heartbreak. Heartbreak for them. So, and, you know, they, this, I think, and to compound matters, Mark Pittman, he'd had a bad fall on Cheltenham Gold Cup Day and he'd had a real race against time to get back to ride it. So he's gone through all that, done everything right, and that then oh. happens, you know. But, but a memorable race, no doubt about it. So the last one we're going to do, Phil, is 2001. Again, not necessarily a race people remember for the right reasons, but 
a race that Anthony McCoy remembers. I remember interviewing in all the 2000s ahead of 2010 saying, I'm never going to win this race. But the, he said his best chance was in 2001 where he was absolutely swinging on blowing wind. He was, yeah. I mean, it's, I think we've probably sort of got to take the race's purist heads off a little bit. I mean, it, it's the kind of race which does add to the national mystique. You know, we, Foyne Avon's remembered because yeah. of what happened. Um, I mean, the Void race, is, it was a chaos, but yeah. everyone remembers it and people remember the bomb scare and the Monday National. And it all sort of tied into the fact when you have a race where only two finish without, without sort of having to be remounted. It was chaos. I mean, <laughs> the backdrop was, of course, it was the foot and mouth year. We'd, we'd had no Cheltenham Festival and there was just biblical rain on the morning of the Grand National. And I mean, I don't think they should have raced. I thought it was unraceable on the Mildmay course, let alone, it was probably even worse on the Mildmay course than the Grand National. Uh, but there was a real need for it to take place. It was important for the industry for it to take place. And there was carnage at the first canal turn. There was a riderless horse, Paddy's return, who I'd actually backed, and seated at the third. He had the headgear on and probably was just, you know, wasn't aware. He was running into other runners. He got to the canal turn, thought, I'm not going to jump that. Put the brakes on and just went straight into the, uh, the, the first sort of eight or nine got over safety and he wiped out most of the rest. I think 10 horses were wiped out and that including the, the favourite moral support and um, Melai Moss who'd been second the year before was out of the race but I think that might actually be in a godsend because it thinned the field out and it made them go a lot slower I think if you'd had like a full field carrying on I think it could have been even grimmer viewing because you'd have had exhausted horses having to refuse late yeah, on and yeah. I think the fact it, it, it whittled down in number and they were going so slowly and could just hack round may have been a blessing in disguise yeah, I mean, the loose horses were going everywhere and poor old Tony McCoy and Ruby Walsh, they, they'd done very well to avoid all that trouble and they got wiped out of the big ditch um, going out in the second circuit, which left three horses. Bo, who Carl Leonard had lost the reins on, went at the next fence, then it was down to two and, you know, it went down in folklore. I think it was the slowest time ever. But it was reminiscent of the 1928 race where there'd also been a pile-up at the first canal turn and that had been caused by a horse, horse called Easter Hero who was, many people consider, was probably the best post-war horse. Some, some racing historians rated him even higher than Golden Miller. And he'd been leading, and the canal turn in those days was an open ditch. And he'd landed in the ditch and then ran up and started, he was in front, and then ran up and down the ditch and wiped out most of the field in doing it. That, only two ended up finishing that day, and there were two of them still standing going to the last. And one of them was an American horse called Billy Barton. They'd come all the way over, big deal, American champion horse. He fell at the last was remounted to finish second and it was a hundred to one shot called Tipperary Tim who went on to win it. So uh, that, that was all caused by the canal turn. Amazing. Yeah. Great to go down memory lane, Phil. Thank you very much indeed. No problem.